Well, I'm going to take a sit down. It is. Ah, welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show from a beach in Dorset. I'm not going to mention the beach because the last time I fished here, they gave me, the local council gave me a very, very dubious parking ticket. So I've got to get my £25 back somehow. So hopefully people won't know where the beach is and they won't get caught like me. Anyway, I'm down here. It is so flat. I cannot tell you how flat it is. It's lovely. It is. I start about three o'clock. It's three twenty-five. I'm only waiting for darkness. All I'm waiting for. A lot of you guys out there have said just a general emails. We don't care what you catch. We don't even care if you don't catch. Some said just want to see what you're doing. Well, hang on. I definitely want to catch. That's the idea. The general object of the exercise is to catch a fish if I can. Obviously, looking around here, there's loads of people walking up and down. I just happen to enjoy my way of being peace and quiet with the bait in the water. If I'm walking up and down, that's great. Nothing's ever going to happen there. But I'm sitting here enjoying the same stillness of a winter's day, if you like. But I've got baits in the water. Anything could happen. Anything could happen in the next half hour. In fact, I hope it does. But it's a beach that I've only fished a couple of times briefly, briefly before, but I quite like, I quite like because car park's only over there. I can walk a couple of hundred yards to anywhere on this beach. I don't, I don't know the beach, I even just fish here. And it doesn't seem to, it got double tide, so it doesn't go in and out very far, if that makes, if that makes sense. And you'll see behind me, I've got my rods out. I've got one squid head on, a fresh squid head uh, out there. Um, that's the only big bait I've got. The others are like sand hills, small sand hills, sections of sand hills tiny little bits of, um, uh, what have I got out there? Black lug, which is a blow wrap lug, not, not, blow, not blow lug, the black lug wraps been thawed out. It's a bit yucky, but I've, I've elasticated it on. It's very small hooks. And I'm gonna chuck a couple of rods out in a minute, very, very close. I've had two or three really hammering, hammering bites there that um, haven't come to anything, but I haven't checked the bait yet. And that's the object of the exercise. I've done a bit of beach combing. I've been up and down the beach, having a bit of beach combing. And the benefit is, it's going to get quieter and quieter as people, you know, get colder and I have to wrap up, obviously. It gets darker. They don't want to be out in the dark walking up and down the beach. Who would do? Me. I want to be walking around up and down winding and fishing. So anyway, I'll tell you what I did find along the shingle here. Um, a bait we used to use years ago, which is banned, totally banned now, so they tell me. I'll show you what it is. All right, I'm going to show you these down here. Just on the sand, you'll be able to see them. And these are called slipper limpets. That one's not, that was just a pretty pretty, I'll show you that in a minute. These are called slipper limpets and they attach each other to the back of each other like that. Now you can't, there I go, that's a slipper limit in there. Now they're saying now, we used this as kids, wait for this, 60 years ago, 60 years ago the beaches were littered with them, um, certainly at my end in Hampshire, at Dorset, especially after a storm they're a brilliant bait, but now they say this slipper limpet, wait for this, it's an invasive species. How can it be an invasive species when they must have been around hundreds of years, hundreds. I mean, I used them as bait 60 years ago, but now you mustn't look at them, touch them, do anything. Well, I'll probably go to prison, 10 year prison sentence for touching and showing you what a slip limp it was. But there you go, this is in the UK. Other countries obviously might have more different rules and they detach themselves like that. I've got that one just up on the tide line to show you. See how he's suckered to that stone there and there's the weed, quite pretty. So. And then what would happen, another one would come up, and then you could get a bunch, you could get six or eight or ten years ago, all stuck to each other like that. They'd all be stuck to each other. Brilliant bait, especially after a storm. And these used to get tumbled around like these have, look, and the shells got broken. They die inside, and then they get washed out here. They get washed out, and they're tumbled in the littoral zone, just outside a big stormy area. It's flat calm today, there is no littoral zone. But they're a very, very good bait, or well, they were years ago. Um, Fishing in close, fishing in close. The biggest fish I had, I think I had a big cod on one once. So I think it might have been limpet and ragworm cocktail. But again, just check your different countries. So we get all these bizarre records and rules and regulations and God knows what else to stop us going fishing. That is indeed the slipper limpet that you mustn't use or even look at. Now, there's a couple of other pretty ones. Look at that one. I do like a bit of beach coming. Lovely colours in that one. I'm calling that a cockle, but it's unusual colours. And this one, is that a periwinkle? But I'm sort of fascinated by that pearlescent there. That little bit of, whether you'll see that there or not, I don't know. Like a sort of pearl. Pretty one, anyway, it's nice to go shell collecting. All this passes a time while I'm fishing.
And the other thing you can find on beaches, just so youngsters, we used to do a lot of beach coming years ago. This thing, look, yeah, quite common on the south coast beaches. That, believe it or not, is the backbone of the cuttlefish. And that is a piece of cuttle bone, cuttle skeleton. And years ago, they used to use those in budgie cages. The budgies used to like pecking at them. Now, I don't know whether they actually ate it because, you know, it must have calcium in it being like a bone there, or whether it was to sharpen their beaks. But in those days, grandma had pigeon, uh, pigeons, <laughs> budgies in the cages, which I don't agree with now. They ought to have wild birds, ought to be flying wild. This is a man who's fishing mine. And that's what they used to sharpen their beaks on those. Something of interest for you. Well, that little rattly bite, I found the culprit. Here it is. Possibly the tiniest whiting I've had for many a session. But it shows you the fish are out there. Look at the size of hook he's taken. That's ridiculous. I've got tiny hooks that he's supposed to take and he hasn't. He's taken like a 2-0 or something like that. But anyhow, there's a chance there might be some more about when it gets dark. And I'm going to go to a lighter. I'm going to use a carp lead now and just lob it out there a little bit way. I think it's going down the tide. I'm not really sure, to be honest. But I'm going to move my gear down and then Hopefully not so many people saying, uh, are you fishing, mister? That type of thing. Let's get this guy back. That is as flat as you could want. My goodness me, I wish I was out in my boat today. And as you can see down the beach, down that way as far as you can see, and come back this way as far as you can see all the way around till I just see dots. There is nobody fishing, it is just, that's right, moi. Toughing it out for that totally awesome fishing show. No, it's got nothing to do with the fact that I want to get away from the wife and the kids and the dog and the lawnmower. It's nothing to do with that whatsoever. This is totally, totally work for Mike's channel, TA Fishing and TA Outdoors. It's work, it's, it's what it is. It's research. Is this tide coming in? Is it going out? What on earth is it doing? Ah, oh, boys, second pin white in. Well, I've been getting quite a few of these guys. Bites all the time. Very, very small whiting, pin white in there. What we call pin whiting. Well, I think some places they just call them silvers. Not a big fish, that's on the ragworm. Not a good sign, I don't feel. I mean, it's nice to see some fish biting like this, you can see. Nice to see them biting, but I just hope it's not going to be a night of these little chappies. That, the only good thing is there might be a big collar of bass about, and that's what they eat. That is exactly a six inch size that, uh, that they eat. So I get this one back, and I think I'll just still stick with the small baits for a while. I've had nothing at all on uh, the big squid. Let's get this little chappie back.
Well, here we go, people, a bit more like it. That is a nice big pout in there. And another one of the white in, just a tad bigger, just a little bit bigger that you see those. A little bit bigger, pouting and white, a double shot this time. Ah, oh, got a spare hook there. You'd think I'd get three out of three, wouldn't you? But, good bit of action, that's something anyway. There's always hope, at least as, with the pouting turning up like this one, you can see a, bit, you know, a bigger pout, at least with something like that turning up, there's a uh, different species moved in. And I'm getting quite a lot of bites now on the small hook, so we just sort of stick it out as we're going at the moment. And fingers crossed, maybe we get lucky with something else. Anyway, two at a time, I'm quite happy. See what I'm using here, nine foot spinning rod. Right, look at the size of the lead. Just a, just a regular bomb there, let's put this out for you, you can see it better. And you can see what I'm using here, just a regular carp lead, that's all I'm using. So there's no reason, flat carp like this, you can't get down here with your carp and pipe rods. 15 pound line, just give it a throw, give it a go, give it a throw. That's a new saying, give it a throw and give it a go. Well, time for some grub, guys. This is a boon, this little shield. It's only small, as you can see. Takes the edge off that wind, and I'm going to have, for tonight's menu, spaghetti bolognese, if I've got a spoon. There we go. Hopefully this will keep me going. Tune that light up a bit there. Right, get this right on top of it. Well, I've had more whiting. That's why I'm having so much to eat, guys. I have more whiting, no more pouting. So I might just well get some, get some grub on the go. We can go in the bait tank. That will probably want tuning down quite a bit. Otherwise it's gonna be not toast, because we haven't got toast. I'm trying to squeeze as much as I can out of this this bottle here. So I'm still getting whiting about this big, you know. So it's better than nothing, trust me, it's better than a blank, but sort of disappointed there's not the odd different species throwing itself up out here. I don't know whether you'll see those rod tops if I Tip that up, then it's on full power. Wallop. The trouble is you get people walking along the promenade that can now see them. Oh my God, there's a fisherman down there. And come down there and pester me and say, you know, have you caught anything, mate? And then, of course, they see you wind away white again. It's a funny sort of bumping effect out there. It's almost like it's a, a feel like a shingle. It's, it is a bit strange, but there you go, there's my rod tops remaining relatively motionless. I have a fear not because the spag ball is on the go. What I don't understand is that tide just here, look, only you see that it's going nowhere. I've been in like two or three hours and nothing's happened to it. It is most peculiar. Is there any action here on the spag ball? Occasional bubble and a bowl. I've learnt not to use a plate on sloping beaches or shingle or rocks because it tips over and all your food goes out. Far better use a bowl. Just a little tip there. And I could cook on the beach but these little burners, providing you put this shield around it like this, so the flame, you get the most out of your flame. I think I can go a tad higher. I have got another bottle, in fairness, I have got another canister rather, but I don't have another canister of those, that's better, now it's on the bowl. Right, let's sit back and relax. Well, the old spag bowl appears to be, let's have a look in there, I think you'll agree guys, it's bubbling away just nicely. Maybe I'm going to set a new record and actually stick the spag bowl to a non-stick pan. 
Let's have a look. Yep. I think that's scalding enough. You can see. Turn that off. Putting it in a bowl is so much easier because I can put it on the shingle. No stones in it. And rinse the saucepan out in the, in the sea and then wash it out properly when I get home. Job done. You can't be in the winter a bit of hot food. And you know what? It's so easy with these little burners. Brilliant. Let's get stuck in. And while I'm waiting, and I'll tell you what I do, I have noticed. Because it's so flat calm, you can see absolutely everything, every movement on the rod top. But the difference between my two main, I'm going to call them my, 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 my longer rods, 12 footers, the beach casting rods, is I've got mono on one and I've got braid on the other. One is, uh, it's called, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a 2400, the other one's a 2600. That is the model number. Um, so say one throws six to eight ounces, the other one throws four to six ounces, so not much between them. So you think the softer one will register the better bites, the softer tip, but it doesn't actually. The braid is so non-stretch that even with the stiffer rod, heavier lead, blah, 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 it just bang, 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 bang. If the whiting are on it, or the power tip, round alive you think you've got a major take going on there. And all they're doing is nibbling and pulling at the bait, whereas on the nylon line, there's so much stretch in it, you, you, you don't see anything like the bites. I think I am getting the bites on the nylon because when I bring them both in, they, all the words are both chewed on both, you know, both rigs. They're both chewed, so I know it's working, but it's just visually seeing which one is a better bite. Braid does appear, really, for flat, open beach fishing like this to be the way forward for bite detection. I mean, there's no question that it's much, much better. Let's finish off with a couple more fish. Come on. Right, while I'm waiting for the bites, I'm going to whack that right open. And you can see, hopefully, let's put that up there. I've got my newfound pole there. So you should be able to see the rod tops. And still hear me talking 10 feet below. Around is my spinner, just up there. I'll put some of that non -refl uh, reflective tape on the tip tips of those and just general white paint but listen you can see this hopefully perfectly here if in the dark you've got shoes and not boots or waders or wellingtons you just got boots you don't want to get a booty when you go out in the dark to cast don't forget I've got this massive floodlight look at the semicircles where it goes hopefully you can see this over here look there I'll get really close to it so it's going sand shingle down here sand shing it's alternating where the waves have done it up there now when you get a surge or a wave come in it will come up this sand first because the shingle doesn't get washed back as quickly so it leaves a little bit of a hump there now that might only be six or eight inches but you can see just there that wave came right in i mean it's so flat today it's just ridiculous i'm trying to sort of illustrate the fact that in there if you stood in there casting when the wave comes in it's more likely to give you a booty but here it's like a little bit of a a sort of a, a jetty, a little bit of a land there if you like. You might be able to see it down there, I don't know there. It comes in there, so I can go right out here, look. I can get right down to here, cast, and I shouldn't get a booty, because you can see the water comes up in there. Look, it's only a minor tip. I think what's against me is the water is so clear, look at that. That is absolutely clear. I have to think maybe I should have gone squid fishing off the uh, pier tonight. That is so clear. It's so peaceful as well. Now there you can see those humps hopefully there in the light and you see the wave cuts up in here so I could stand over there get an extra two or three feet but more important I don't get my boots wet. And what's happening up here? It looks like absolutely nothing is happening up there. Extremely motionless. The worms, boys, are... I'll tune it down a bit for this. The worms I've got aren't the greatest, I have to say. The last few years, 
the last few years they seem to be digging smaller and smaller and smaller worms. You know, we've all get, had small worms, even if we dug them ourselves, but look, these are supposed to be commercially dug ones. Look what they're digging now. Bit sad, really, isn't it? If you wanted those for the mullet, that's one thing, but they're just digging these commercially now. And some of them are tiny. Some of them are tiny, extremely expensive, so you almost need three of those to make a decent uh, bass bait. So I don't exactly have a lot of bait left. And no real big worms at all. I'm going to do my washing up in a second. And I fear I might even give it a little bit of an early shout. Because it does seem very, very quiet. And indeed, on the end of this one is, is, is the reason I'm going home. There. A tiny pin whitehead. Let's put that down there. I don't know if you're going to see this in the light there. There's the whitey. You see how clear that water is when it comes in. Unbelievably clear. So a tiny pin whiting. Back he goes. He swam away fine. I'm done. But listen guys, I don't know whether to take you back to the tackle shack or take you to another fishing spot. Whatever happens, although I'm packing up, do not worry. I will return with either a visit to the tackle shack or another fishing venue. I'm packing up, but don't switch off. Let's try this one. You can tell I've cut it pretty far because the waves are literally down there in front of me. Well, there are quite a few white and I feel there might even be a customer on here, but it is of no size really whatsoever. Lots of little bites. Hopefully you're going to get some of this, uh, this winding. And this was with just a carp lead on there, which is sort of interesting, but the conditions are not good for fishing, but good for casting. Here comes another customer. Yes, sir. Always make sure in the light, guys, there is not one of the dreaded weavers. And there you should be able to see in the light if, if this system is working for me. There you go, another whiting there. I've only got a very small hook, so he should go back okay. This one's got the grip lead. Grip lead on it. And I did go and finish all the worms off this time. Someone's squeaking on this one. Surprised you couldn't see a basco pass in this clear water. I don't think there's anything on this one. Indeed, there's not. That one is as clean as the day it was sent out, including the sand hill. Well, well, well. Might just pull this, pull this in, so you can see there. Very, very clear. So put that back there. This is all a test. Nothing on this one, I fear. Now that was a tough beach session, but do you know what? I still like getting out there on a still winter's night. I know, yes, I know, flat calm, still ocean conditions aren't the best for shore for sheep, but you know what? It's just nice to get out there. It's peaceful, it's quiet. I still like it. Now I've been making things out of pallet wood for somewhere over 40 years. It's not new to me. I started, started doing it years and years ago. I've made everything from boats to cabins. They're on Mike's TA Outdoors, if you want to go and see them, they're all over there I think. Anyway, 
for years. I would save money by straightening nails out. I loved it. Why not straighten a nail out and use it again? A four inch nail, a three inch nail, I'm not saying little one inch nails. Big nails, why well, not to go and buy them? Yes, I can buy them by the lorry load if I want, I'm not bothered, but I'm not going to. As the saying goes, a fool and his money are soon parted. But, talking of fools, if I've been doing it for 40 years, how come for 39 years, when I've been burning all the scrap wood off, left over for my projects, in my log burner for heat, I didn't save the nails by using a magnet and getting them out? I mean, they're straight. I haven't got to do all that wrist bending and bashing to get them out. And do you know what, boys? I think it works. So using that magnet, I not only get a free fire, I get free nails, the garden gets some nice ash, but I'll tell you what boys, after all that digging, I think it's time for a cuppa on the G-stove. The old girl, the kettle, is about to send off the whistle. Also, talking about nails and things that are free, somebody dumped on one of our properties two garden chairs. I looked, I thought, I think they're okay. I've got an Allen key that will tighten the little nut joints up. A little bit of wear on the bottom of the wood. They are perfect, but perfect for the outside of the tackle shack. Sit there in the summer, relax, chill. I stained them. I've got a stain, one with wood stain, but it's expensive. I stained the other with just fence stain because it's cheap and I've got some left over. We'll see whether it's me or the wife that gets out of the seat like this and it's got all stripes all across. Well, I won't have stripes over my dress, but the wife might have some stripes over hers. I still marvel at the power of steam that comes out of that kettle. It's scaldingly hot. It's like pressurized. And do you know what years ago, they used to make engines, sawmills, trains, everything ran by steam. Incredible power and it actually helped shape our country, both industrial, agricultural, and steamships. So when I dropped into our local carnival, I'm straight over to the miniature steam engines. It's got everything. The noise and the steam, it's amazing. I mean, look at what the people a generation ago could build. These things are ancient, they're still running today. So while I'm marvelling in the steam coming out of this kettle on my little fire, let's look at a few shots here where I went one summer and we've got pictures of miniature steam engines in actions. All those old guys out there, sit back and enjoy. Young people, just think, could you make one of those?
well, there we go, boys. You can't go wrong with look, a proper cup of tea. Cheers. I know this is going to be hot. Ah. I believe it was in the metal cup. I put it in the metal cup, trying to keep it a bit warm. Well, that, boys, is a little insight into what quality British engineering and craftsmanship can do with good steel. Still going. I mean, look, when I was younger, in fact, is there anybody out there still going that remembers playing with little model steam engines? I mean, I played with model steam engines. You could buy them in the shops. I played with, I'm a child of the 1950s, just after the Second World War, so there was stuff that boys could play with, like what I call proper boy stuff. Is anybody out there remember the, the Mamod, I think it was, steam engines? Like that traction engine, or a work unit it used to be. Do you know what we used to be? I was probably nine, eight, nine, ten, I don't even think, barely ten, and what you would get for a Christmas present or a birthday present would be one of the Mamod engines, and then you just went off somewhere and you played with, wait for this, methylated spirits, lighters, boiling scalding water, and moving parts. Now, for boys, that's got to be some fun, isn't it? Honestly, the youngsters today don't know what they're missing. I wouldn't have missed that for the world playing with those, and that's why I'm fascinated, you know, fascinated by those old steam engines. And I dare say, there's probably people the world over that go, oh my God, I remember playing with those. Well, listen, I don't know what they play with today. But I was, that's what I was brought up on. Don't know about anybody else. Listen, there's no doubt at all in my mind that at the age of nine, playing with that, with that lot, can you imagine the health and safety inspector today? I mean, when Mike was teaching, he said, if a kid falls over, I have to get like three people to put a plaster, to ask, can they put a plaster on the little boy that's fallen over? It's some sick society we live in, I'm telling you. What else have I done other than those stain those chairs? Oh yeah, actually, I've done the ceiling again with um, anti-mould paint up there, that's been done. A couple of bubble marks on it, so I don't know whether that's got a slight leak in it that might come through. Do you remember the people who watched us when I actually renovated this whole thing to make a little film studio of it? I did put uh, a piece of felt over it and sealed it as well, but I did say it was, you know, going to have to be upgraded, probably the whole roof. I can't remember when I did it, probably about four months ago, so it could be creeping and then we've had a horrific lot of rain. The fire's going down a bit now, no need to uh, do any more with that. Gonna take the wife out today, keep her sweet, pub meal, nice pub roast, that way I can go fishing. No chance of fishing guys, if you wonder why I'm in here. It is rip-roaring wind out there, they gave 18 miles an hour, we got gusts of 30, I couldn't even light the bonfire. If I lit the bonfire here, it would be setting light to half Australia, I should think, by now. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed this one. I've enjoyed it, must admit. It's something different. If you like these type of different ones, let me know. I've got plenty of films out there. I've got lots more films. And of course, playing with those type of toys, which were working, real working modern toys, you have pulley wheels, you can get little pumps going and everything. There's no doubt playing with lighters, methylated spirits, scalding, boiling, pressurised steam. There's no doubt, even at the age of nine, I got burnt. No, I expect most people do. How else are you supposed to learn? You know, I try and tell my kids, like my dad used to say, look boy, just because I put my head in the fire doesn't mean to say you have to as well. Learn from my mistakes. I tell that to my kids, and what do the next generation do? They don't really learn, do they? It's just the way it is. You need to get burned to know what pain is, and then you won't touch it again. I know this cup's hot. We'll see you guys again. Thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Look out for Mike's TA Outdoors. What did he put up recently? A roundhouse, that one's going well. Building different stuff. I think we've got a couple of other jobs to do. And I'll be going down to Somerset, I dare say, to do some work down his house as well at some stage. And once this wind goes down, I sure aim to go fishing. I've got a project to cycle miles and catch a fish off a beach that no other person's probably even discovered. Cheers guys, we'll see you next time.